All right. Hi, everybody. Um, it is great to see so many folks and people's um, avatars for those who've turned off their video, which is A-OK. -okay. Um, super excited for this webinar uh, today. Um, as you probably have gathered, um, Wes, who is our host, has muted everybody. Um, and we will have a chance for folks to chime in um, towards the end, but this will just uh, keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, and folks are free to use their video or not uh, if you're not speaking at the time. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in um, and get us kicked off. This was the second most voted for topic um, when I surveyed the list about webinar topics um, around measuring impact and storytelling. And I think part of that is because it applies across um, organizational stage and issue area and legal structure um, and is something that uh, I think a lot of us spend a lot of time thinking about how we make sure we're being effective and how we um, let others know that that's the case. Um, so having impact is what uh, we care about, but measuring impact is what tells us that we're actually having the impact that we intend. And storytelling around this impact is what convinces others. So on this webinar, we're gonna talk about how to measure what I think of as capital I impact, which is um, what actually motivated you to start or join your company in the first place? Not the sort of progress to goals over the course of a quarter, but um, the progress towards your mission over the course of the lifetime of your organization. Um, and mission impact is usually the hardest type to measure um, because it often involves um, changing systems, mindsets, and impacting outcomes for large groups of people that you may never interact with directly. 
Um, the structure of this webinar is going to be a set of mini case studies followed by Q&A. So I'll set the stage a little bit with my experience with Code 2040, but I'm really going to hand it over to four of your portfolio mates, Jen Brandel um, from Harkin, Yoni Landau, Resistance Labs, Vanessa Liberde, uh, Dreamwriter Productions, and Lee Phillips um, of Earn. And after they're done, we'll turn to a Q&A. Um, so as the webinar goes, um, please drop any questions that you think of into um, the group chat, which you should be able to pull up. I think there's like a little hamburger or three dots that you can click on to get the chat to show if you're not seeing it. Um, send them to everyone and then we'll be collecting the questions as we go. Um, and we'll have a chance for people to chime in towards the end as well. Um, so um, diving in, um, oh, and just a note that we're recording the webinar, um, so it will be posted in uh, your portfolio resources folder, which I will remind everyone where to find and how to access via email afterwards. Um, so uh, you'll have this and the notes from it um, in that folder uh, to reference later. So um, when I was thinking about uh, kind of the topic, I was reflecting on my time running Code 2040, an organization at which our, for which our vision was proportional representation of Black and Latinx folks in all aspects of the innovation economy by 2020, uh, by 2040, excuse me. But the scale and strategy of the organization meant that we intended to be sort of a first domino in systems change, and it was challenging sometimes to trace the thread of our impact through to the vision. But it was extremely important both for changing hearts and minds and for fundraising. Um, and I really used to rely on two main data points to help people see our impact towards this mission of proportional representation in the industry. The first was the return offer rate for our summer fellows, and the second was this idea that tech companies' household names were rebuilding their hiring processes based on our feedback. Um, the narrative when we started Code 2040 was that Black and Latinx folks were not qualified for available jobs in tech. The talent was inferior, and the assumption was that Code 2040 and organizations who cared about diversity were doing charity work. Um, this view was so entrenched that at the time when I would talk about Code 2040 running a career accelerator for Black and Latinx computer science majors, people would somehow assume that I was teaching small children to code. It was like it did not compute that there was actually um, talent like this ready to join the industry. So we ended up using a simple data point to cause folks to internalize this fact, which was that our students, when they interned at top tech companies, got return offers at a rate twice as high as the industry average. It was 54% as opposed to 26%. And combining that metric with some other pre and post data from the summer really created a picture um, of the idea that our students were extremely qualified and um, likely to persist and succeed as a result of their participation in the program. Um, that actually really helped us achieve um, the second thing, which was helping companies to rebuild their hiring practices. Um, so I used to tell, uh, sort of point out to folks the idea that companies, while they think they're experts in their hiring practice, actually don't tend to have very good data about it because while they have the internal data about what happens to folks they do hire, they don't have the data to what happens um, to folks that they don't hire. And Code 2040, the way we were structured with a closed pool of talent and a closed pool of companies hiring, we could actually help companies see um, what we, called their false negatives. So you see your false positives, you hire someone who doesn't work out, but companies don't see their false negatives when they pass on someone who would have been great. At Code 2040, we could help them see that. So we could say like those six candidates that you said weren't qualified, here's the six companies they ended up at, and don't you consider those your peers. And that helped us start a conversation about how there was bias baked into hiring practices. And we use that to sit down with nine tech companies, including Lyft and Medium and other name brands, to help them completely rewrite their entry-level hiring process. And that is a story that I used to tell as a concrete example of both um, the impact that Code 2040 had, but also how our direct service programs fed system change work 
um, and helped, uh, it really helps funders and um, reporters actually understand our relevance to the industry. Um, so those are sort of two different approaches, one a little bit more data driven with like surveys and percentages and the other a little bit more anecdote driven um, that we used to use to sort of capture and persuade um, with our impact. And the goal of this webinar is to um, help understand, help you understand uh, a variety of approaches, um, best practices, creative ways to measure into effective impact stories that you can kind of crystallize and rely on moving forward. Um, so I am going to kick it over now to our fabulous guest speakers, um, who I think maybe are able to unmute themselves. Yes. Um, awesome. <laughs> um, and each of them will have about four minutes to kind of run you through the high level, and then we'll have plenty of time to ask them questions at the end. So please drop your questions in the chat box as you think of them. Um, and uh, Jen will kick it off. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, my name is Jen Brandell. I run a company called Harkin, um, and we have been around since 2015. Uh, and Wes, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll give a little bit more uh, context on what we do. Um, we are a for-profit company, just in terms of how we're organized. We're not profitable yet. Uh, we are one of those companies that is in the confusing space between being mission-driven and for-profit and having a tech component and having a consulting component, which is not scalable. And so um, we are a, a quote-unquote zebra company, if you guys have heard about that um, kind of type of company, and I'm actually a co-founder of the Zebras Unite uh, movement of trying to find capital for these weird companies that kind of sit in between um, systems. But just to let you know about what we've been experimenting with since 2015, um, and in terms of our data and impact, uh, we have changed so many times, and we don't have one like golden metric or one golden um, you know, anecdote or thing to look at to know how we're doing. We actually have a collection of things and a collection of viewpoints that we pay attention to and try and track as best as we can and use in different contexts, uh, whether that's for fundraising, for investors, or for working with foundations to have them create subsidy funds uh, or to work with newsrooms to convince them to partner with us. We really have kind of a grab bag of things that we, that we track and look at. So Harkin, just what we do, um, the word itself means listen. You might have heard it in a lot of Christmas songs around listening to angels sing, etc. And our whole thing is that we believe every individual is worthy of being heard. And so our data at this point that's the most important to us is just whether or not we're still in business. Our customers, yeah, if you go back, okay, perfect. Um, if customers are still uh, with us, so if they are uh, finding enough value to renew, um, it's no, it's no like mystery or, or secret that news organizations don't have a lot of disposable income right now. So we see it as a very big uh, indicator that we're doing something helpful if they're coming back to us year after year. Although that's changing a little bit because we are turning more toward consulting, which is could be one-time revenue um, and doesn't necessarily have to be recurring like tech is. So that's going to change too <laughs> as we figure out what are the metrics that are most important for us uh, just to know that we're, we're doing well from an investor point of view and from a company growth point of view. Um, but the most important data for our partners is something that we pay a lot of attention to and it just varies wildly. So we can go to the next slide. Um, when we work with partners, we ask them, you know, what is important to you? What are the metrics that your bosses care about, that your stakeholders care about? We work with nonprofits and for-profit newsrooms that uh, have a variety of different things that, that they care about, some that we disagree with and think are terrible ways of measuring impact, but we need to help them see how what we do can move the needle on even some of those things we don't agree with. Um, so our, our partners care about things like increasing revenue. So we track that. Are we able to um, bring more money into that newsroom? Are we able to help them increase reach? So have their stories uh, travel further and, and, and uh, more effectively? Can we increase the amount of time people are spending on their pages? And um, it's a metric that some newsrooms still really care about is like, are they winning awards for their stories? And so these are kind of the big four categories uh, that newsrooms tend to look at to see or try and move the needle on that we know we can can help them with. Um, and then we're also trying to help them with more equity kind of uh, measures too. So where are they hearing from? 
are they hearing from zip codes and postal codes of people who are underrepresented in their coverage, who aren't typically uh, news consumers of theirs, and how do they start to reach them better? So we're also at the same time trying to help them build internal capability, uh, create a path to paying subscribers, and look at their geographic and demographic data spread. So we track a lot of different things depending on the news organization, and then uh, push back out to them the stuff that they have said they care about. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, but the other thing, so kind of building off what Laura said, is that you know there's the hard data, the numbers that we can measure, and then there's the the anecdotes. And I I'm really a fan of the powerful stories we can tell. So here's just one example of one that I'll trot out for funders or for people who are like, well, what what is what you do change in the world? Uh, so here's an example. This woman Molly asked a question to WBEZ, this newsroom, um, about gun violence in Chicago. She got an answer, and her friend Kate heard about that opportunity. statues in Chicago of women are figured it like an angel or, you know, um, a dancer or something. And so by Kate asking this question and having it answered, they were able to show, the newsroom was able to show how statues got made and also crowdsource what statues should be made of women in Chicago. And this allowed the public to start to say, hey, we can do something about this. This is not right. So go to next slide. Um, you have one minute, Jen. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, what ended up happening was this story being published, so us working with the newsroom to help them listen to people they serve and answer their questions, created the story that then created statues of women in Chicago being made. So that's something that like, you know, is beautiful impact that we helped create the domino effect for and the power dynamic for, but would be really impossible for us to measure or, you know, see unless newsrooms reported back to us what, what was happening with the stories that resulted from our process. So the next slide is, um, I did ask Twitter just a little while ago because a researcher asked us what we have achieved. And I got some really fantastic uh, comments from people, you know, that we're helping folks think different, we're shifting a paradigm, we're contributing to altering one-way communications, all stuff that's amazing. And that has been my goal and really what we're out set out to do, but that's not something I feel like I could put in a pitch deck and have any investor take me seriously. It's like, we're here to change a paradigm. How are you gonna measure that? So it's good to know that we are working, but again, this isn't something I think I can use to raise money on. Uh, and then the last slide I just wanted to, to mention real quick, there's this woman named Nora Bateson who's doing incredible work around warm data. So thinking about what are the things that you can't measure, but the relationships between the systems change that a lot of us are working in right now, and how do you start to value and, um, and contextualize that kind of stuff that is, is not in a bar graph or something that can really be isolated. So there's a ton of stuff if you Google warm data um, to check out. So yeah, that's, that's Harkin in a nutshell. And I will let you move on to uh, the next person. Thank you so much, Yoni, you're up. Hey folks, uh, I'm Yoni Landau. Uh, I run Resistance Labs, which is a consulting firm that uh, runs texting programs uh, for all kinds of democratic folks. And one of our programs that we incubated is called Contest Every Race. Contest Every Race is a coalition that's focused on making sure Democrats run for uncontested offices in rural areas. Um, so go to the next slide, Wes, thanks so much. Uh, so here's how it works. We find uncontested school board municipal races, for instance, let's say in Oklahoma, um, that our Republicans are running for and Democrats are not running for. We text uh, Democrats in those districts to ask them to run, saying, you know, would you, would you consider running for office in, in your county? Would you consider running for office to, you know, address infrastructure problems, um, whatever. People who raise their hand, we give them filing information. We give them all kinds of training and support information. We actually schedule meetings in their county. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty ambitious program. Um, it's a pretty ambitious, big problem. 75% of races in Oklahoma went uncontested last cycle. Um, in general, rural America, Democrats are not playing in. So we wanted to know how this worked. Did it, did it actually succeed? So the first thing we did, um, go ahead, Wes, is we took 40,000 people that we tested and 40,000 people that we didn't text of the same kind of 80,000 group. We randomly split 80,000 people into two groups. Um, and the 40,000 that went through our program, one in 1,100 actually filed that round. So we had to comb through the filing records and get every filed person and then match it back to our kind of cell phone records. And then in the control group, it was one in 3,500. So by being in our treatment group, 
no other difference, you're three times more likely to file. This is a randomized control trial. This is kind of the gold standard of research. Um, this, is, this is what we're looking for. This is a persuasive number to folks. Um, there's, there's kind of causal inference here. So we're saying we proved that if you're in our treatment group, you're three times more likely to file. So that's a, that's a good number, but that's actually not our core mission. Our core mission isn't just to get more people to file. Our core mission is to end uncontested races, right? Okay, so how do you check if we're ending uncontested races? You have to use a different set of control group um, treatment variables. So go to the next slide, Wes. Um, we took 420 school board races that we thought were gonna be uncontested in Oklahoma. 210 we treated, 210 we randomly assigned out to our control group. We ran our program on both on, on the treatment group, and we saw that it was something like 65% in the treatment group were still uncontested, still a vast amount. Um, but in the control group, it was 75%, that's the number I just gave you, 75% uncontested in Oklahoma um, school board elections. So um, that gave us another, again, statistically significant, causally inferred assessment. You know, we, we identified that we are reducing uncontested races by 11% via this treatment it's statistically significant um this is again this is this so this was okay this was a great number for us but uh we're actually also looking for some other effects we're looking for better democratic party favorability we want to rebuild the democratic party from the ground up in these rural areas and we also actually want to improve democratic turnout so if i have enough time i'll take you through here's some of the other impact numbers we use people are winning their elections we track demographic categories this is a little more straightforward in terms of measurement. Keep going, Wes. Um, and we are dividing the cost of our program via marginal race contested. And I'll get to the turnout number as well. Keep going, Wes. Um, one thing I wanted to get to folks um, is using surveys. So if you do a randomized control trial, you can measure all kinds of soft data if you can get people to respond to a survey. So. In the next slide, you'll see we texted 5,000 people who we, who we had never reached out to in our control group, and then 5,000 people that we had sent a message about, please run for office to fix infrastructure, please run for office to fix the opioid crisis, please run for office, we need a leader in your county. And then we just texted them, in this case, a single question, what's your favorability, zero to 100, of the Oklahoma Democratic Party? And we saw a 13 point bounce. So this is, this is Obviously persuasive for, you know, for folks running the party. Um, this is interesting data. You can imagine uh, we could test all kinds of things. And so having that control group that we can go back to and survey um, gives us the ability to create very persuasive, soft data about people's habits, perceptions, beliefs, self-reported data. Um, and it looks like I may still have time. I'll keep going. Um, and we also- you have one minute. <laughs> perfect, great. So I, I didn't expect to get through all this. So um, we also wanted to know about turnout. So because we had used districts, geographic areas as control groups, we could then go back and measure the control group and treatment group in turnout and, and see are Democrats turning out more in our treatment areas, which is our hypothesis. If you get people running at the school board city council level, then their friends and family will turn out, their friends and family will be Democrats. And in fact, we did, you can see the last slide, um, we saw a small boost, 1.4% boost of Penn City Dems. Um, so that's the program, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much. You Thank can you. The rest of the slides. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, you're up. Hey, everyone. Um, my name, oh, am I showing? Can you hear me? I'm not seeing myself, I'm just seeing Laura. Yes, we can hear We're you. good? We can, okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm the executive producer of DreamWriter Productions. We inspire generations of environmental change makers. Uh, we started as a theater company in Vancouver, Canada, and um, have transitioned to digital in the last eight years. We've reached over a million kids in 150 cities. That's one of our... Um, we want to scale and we want to show that we can go anywhere. And so one of our, one of our key um, measures is that we've reached um, over a million kids. And now we're in India, which has been really exciting to show people that uh, our work really does go anywhere. So Wes, can you go to the next slide? 
um, what we're really trying to do, I should say, is not just change kids' environmental behavior, they go home and they change their families' behaviors, but really what we're trying to do is create an embodied transformational learning experience that opens them up to worldviews of collaboration, collective action, and inspires them to be change makers for life. I wanted to give a shout out to demonstratingvalue.org. They are with the Van City Credit Union Foundation in Vancouver, and they have a, if somebody is new to measurement, particularly, they have a really accessible, I believe it's all free, um, approach that has really helped us in trying to figure out how to measure some of the immeasurable things that we do. We have, uh, we're really focused, we have been really focused on our municipal partners. We sell to municipal governments or licenses to our program, and then we offer it free to elementary schools. Um, and uh, municipal governments have been very interested in hard data around, do we have less, less waste being produced? Do we have less energy being consumed, less water being consumed? So a lot of our measurements have been around that. Um, one of the th key things that demonstrating value helped us see is that an indicator of change is about as valuable as um, a more specific calculated formula, um, especially around environmental change. They gave the example of when you install solar panels, um, you know, you might think, oh, this solar panel has this capacity to reduce energy consumption, but you don't know if they've installed a new fridge or they have five more people staying in the house or that kind of, there's so many inherent assumptions and along the lines of measurement. So we went the route of showing that an indicator, uh, that an indicator that change has happened. Um, we do know that most children do go home and try to change their parents, uh, their family's um, behaviors. And a really large number of them succeed because our program is super exciting. If you can think of, it's like um, a classroom is turned into an interactive theater experience, except the theater part, there's no like live actors, it's all digital. So we get the kids super, super stoked in the classroom um, and it inspires them to go on and do a lot of long-term change. We have realized recently though, that we have been so focused on the municipal goals and measuring those that we we aren't really we hadn't really been measuring but we do really do which we think is this transformational learning experience or you know if you were a kid you had an experience that sort of woke up something in you and then changed your life and that's really what we're trying to do we're trying to do identity based behavior change i guess is another way of saying it so we do have one measure that's always been my favorite which is that 73% of kids in our program say they now feel like real life plant protectors. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. What I think is a value that I know a lot of people here don't do anything like what I'm doing, <laughs> deal with adults or deal with um, uh, politics and that kind of thing. But I think there's something to be learned about how we make measurement and compliance fun um, because Otherwise, what we're doing, the measurement would be called a household audit, which if you imagine yourself as an eight-year-old, sounds about the most boring thing you could possibly imagine. So we gamify and storify everything. So the kids are in a classroom or put into four teams. And every individual action accrues team points. So this is how we gamify participation. Um, and measurement is separated from the points. So you get a point for bugging your parents. <laughs> we call it the power of children bugging their parents is really at the heart of the power of what we're doing in terms of the family's behavior change. But you get a point for your team when you tell your parent to um, not drive the car or to reduce water consumption. And so you get points for effort and not for results. The results in the actual behavior change measurement, the kids take home a mission book and the parent signs off on that mission book and says about the change that we have. And they get a point, the kids get a point for getting their parents to sign it. But the winning team is actually the team that participates the most, not the team that gets the most effect, although usually they're correlated. So, it, but it's a way that, um, that it makes it fun because you're now doing a mission, um, you're, uh, you are, we, we give them the identity of being apprentice planet protectors, attending the planet protector academy. Um, in terms of collective identity and action, that's also gamified in terms of the points, as you I said. Minute, oh, I have one minute. Now, inclusion, I feel, I, when I say inclusion, I want to be careful about what I mean by this because it's really a limited inclusion. We mean all the kids in the classroom be included, whoever they are. It's not um, sort of a further DEI uh, kind of inclusion, although I think it's 
involved. In, in the classroom, it's really easy to do that. We just say nobody wins without teamwork points. And it's amazing. It's like, poof, everybody gets along. I think that's a bit different um, for adults, maybe. But there's certainly, uh, it really, really works to gamify inclusion. The other piece that's really important is uh, that we address, we directly address shame and failure. We make it okay to fail. We have characters who fail, they, like they fail so badly. It's comedy-based work that we do. And they fail so badly that any kid is gonna feel like they can do better. But we also talk about failure, failure and that there's no shame in trying and failing so that we get more accurate data back and, um, and that we help the kids grow and learn and feel safe to do so. And that's about it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, wait. Hi there, can you hear me? Great. Hi, um, everybody. I'm Lee Phillips. I'm the CEO and president of Earn.org. And uh, we run a financial technology platform called Saver Life, which helps working families to save and invest in their futures. So as an organization, uh, we have been doing this work for a long time. We've been around since 2001. I've been CEO since um, 2015. Uh, but in the last few years, we've really transitioned from being a local direct service organization here in San Francisco to a financial technology organization serving clients nationwide. Um, and as a result of that switch over to technology, we've gone from serving about 600 to 1,000 clients a year to over 160,000 members um, have joined in the last two years. And we do this work because what we're interested in is um, solving America's savings crisis and then looking at issues of uh, wealth inequality um, across the country. So uh, you may know, you probably know that about 40% of people in the US uh, couldn't cover a $400 emergency without going into debt. And about two thirds of us are living paycheck to paycheck. So uh, the number one metric that we track, of course, is the number of working Americans who are increasing their savings as a result of joining our Save a Life platform. Um, and we are having a lot of success with that. Our clients are now saving at almost twice the national average, despite uh, incomes of about half the national average. So we're uh, seeing some great gains in people developing financial stability. Our membership are primarily women of color, working mothers with average incomes around $30,000 a year, uh, located all, all across the United States. Uh, next slide, please, Leslie. So um, I'm glad that Vanessa brought up gamification because that's also something that we do. Here are some of the uh, behavior-based savings innovations that we use to help people create a savings habit. Uh, so we encourage people to pledge to um, save their, to save more of their money. Last year, we ran a pledge campaign during tax season, had about 45,000 Americans um, pledge to save uh, their taxes. We do a lot of uh, prize link savings as well as cash, cash matches uh, for savings. We also use um, you know, ideas like stories, uniting people and normalizing behaviors. So people setting goals and resolutions and also talking more about some of their um, challenges with savings. Um, and then we have digital scratch cards that incentivize uh, saving and drive engagement. So basically the way that Saver Life works, you sign up online, you link your savings account to our platform. And when we see positive gains in savings behavior, um, our members are rewarded either with cash rewards or opportunities to win prizes. We also have um, a great online uh, platform website that engages people with financial uh, coaching content um, and other features as well. So, you know, you may be wondering, some of you, why we're a New Media Ventures grantee, like what does this really have to do with um, driving civic engagement? But what we've realized over the last few years is that technology has actually given us two pretty unique and powerful attributes that we really think could be influential in public policy and also driving civic engagement amongst our membership in these issues related specifically to economic mobility. So what we see in, you know, in the world of personal finance is that is a combination, of course, of how the types of decisions that you make as an individual person um, and then also the system in which you're making those uh, decisions. And we know that, you know, largely the, the game is fixed against uh, lower income people um, in ways that really uh, inhibit their ability to be successful financially. Um, so what we are realizing that we have these two attributes. Um, first is that our technology generates a really unique data set uh, into the financial lives of working Americans that we can now use for data and digital advocacy and to really tell a much more powerful story, thank you Wes, into the real lives of, um, of low-income um, or hourly wage workers in America. 
um, and then also gauge the effects of public policy interventions on household financial stability. So this slide shows some of our research capabilities. Um, so when you join Save a Life, uh, you sign up and you answer a, um, a demographic survey. So we know a lot about our users. Uh, we also track their financial gains. But I think probably the most unique is in, in the bottom um, corner there on bank account transaction data. So like all financial technology organizations, um, we get a view only look into the transactional data of accounts that are linked to our platform. Um, but as a nonprofit organization, obviously we're committed to using that data and information um, for good. And so just a couple of things of, of ways that um, we're able to see data. So the prevalence of non-sufficient funds and overdraft fees, we use it to obviously evaluate our own programs. Um, and I'll get into in a moment some other ways that we've been able to look at bank account transaction data. We also have realized that uh, we have a trusted relationship now with over 160,000 people across the country. And we're also on track to hit our goal of reaching a half a million people um, by 2021. So our theory is that hopefully by adding something of value to people's lives, so in this case, helping individual households become more financially secure, we can also then translate that into more collective action. So, you know, in addition to, uh -huh, into the bank account data, we also engage people with uh, surveys and in, uh, interviews. So we're now working to analyze this robust data set, and I'll give you a couple of examples of how we're doing that. Um, so when the government shutdown happened earlier this year, we were able to mount, monitor in real time the financial hit on um, the accounts of uh, people who are linked to our, plat our platform. We then uh, use that to analyze the experiences of people um, on our platform who receive SNAP benefits. We have about 60,000 members who uh, receive SNAP or food stamps. Uh, we combine that with storytelling, so we interview people about their experiences and then use that as ways to illustrate uh, the data. We're now taking a deeper dive on issues like income volatility, so our members have swings in income of about $1,200 month over month. Uh, we polled all of our California members and found that income instability and in um, uh, scheduling at work is the number one issue that's affecting them. So now this month we're taking a deep dive on that issue to look at uh, policy interventions around fair scheduling. So really what we're doing is weaving together this data um, and then the next phase is to hopefully prompt people to take action, engage whether or not we can spur more civic engagement uh, for people to potentially vote or support candidates that would take positions on these types of issues. Um, thank you to all four of you for giving that um, sort of overview and rundown. I think it's really helpful to just see how like the wildly different approaches um, that folks are using. Um, I will kick off with the first question um, and then if folks want to uh, chime in via the chat or um, raising their uh, virtual hands, which I think is a thing. Um, that would be great. Um, so I would love to get a sense from folks of what the balance is between what you measure internally versus externally and kind of the flow of responsibility. Like, do you have someone on your team who's responsible for uh, the impact measurement piece or is there a culture of measurement at the organization? Um, maybe just a couple sentences of the mechanics of what it actually looks like um, to measure and story tell around it. Um, this is this is Jen. We are starting to uh, kind of have a person who's really responsible for like business insights uh, within the company of looking at um, the technical aspect of what we do and how people are using our software, but then also the the qualitative storytelling and gathering. Um, we do all put our the things that we see into what we call sexy Intel tracker, which is basically a spreadsheet that we made that just has like, you know, anecdote data. Uh, is it about, you know, when categorizing it so that we, we just start to grow that brain trust because one person can't have their eyes and ears on everything that we're hearing from partners. So we do ask everyone to dump it into kind of a structured form, but then one person who's much more responsible for kind of like looking at trends overall. So uh, we're early on in that, so I can't say if it's going to work well, but um, that's kind of the direction we're heading. This is Yoni. Go ahead, Yoni. Uh, sorry, I just got someone off. No, go uh, ahead. Thanks. So uh, I am involved in all of the measurement um, and designing the control trials. Um, and basically our COO is responsible for making sure that 
uh, those are adhered to. Um, we worked with the Analyst Institute to do some consulting basically on the design um, and to make sure that we're doing our control trials appropriately. And they also actually referred us to an academic um, who kind of when we have questions about is this going to be a valid statistical inference, um, you know, we can This is Lee. Uh, we have a, a full-time director of research and innovation and a, a full-time research analyst on our team. We also contract more complex data science out to um, a partner um, organization based in Oakland. Uh, everyone in the organization has uh, access to our dashboard, which shows you know, how many folks have joined the platform, savings rates, and so on and so forth, demographics. Um, and that can be um, analyzed by you know, zip code and partnership and so on and so forth. We also provide that data to nonprofit partners so we can set up specific dashboards for our partners who can then tag their own users into the platform and then monitor um, their progress um, over time. Um, we had a question submitted, which is a nuts and bolts question, my favorite kind, um, which is how do you actually go about publishing your data and stories? Is it on your own website, social media, PR firm? Like how do you actually spread the word once you have this data, the type of data that you all have shared? Uh, we, this is Jen from Harkin, we, we do it everywhere we can. So whether it's writing medium posts that compile it, um, having it be stuff that we tweet or retweet, presenting at conferences, uh, we don't have any media or PR uh, firms, so we're just kind of putting it out there ourselves um, and, and just trying to remind people uh, all the time that this, this approach works um, in various ways and, and just playing around with the messaging and also visuals are really helpful. So numbers um, are easy to, to kind of glance over if you're looking on Twitter or Facebook, but if you if you make even with Canva or something that's off the shelf and really easy, just a way of, of putting that number, making it a little more visually exciting, we find that that travels better. Um, this is Lee. So similarly, we do uh, all of the above, but uh, we uh, publish a monthly series called Big Data on Small Savings, um, which kind of forces us to um, analyze our data and, and answer questions in, in new and interesting ways. Um, but one point I would like to add um, to this question is I, I don't always, I feel like in the nonprofit world, we don't always do a great job of sharing data back with the people that data actually belongs to and the people that that data came from. So one of the things that we're really committed to um, going forward is how do we actually involve our Save a Life members in their own uh, data and seeing that data. So I think in the nonprofit sector, we have a habit, um, a bad habit of um, extracting data from people, using it to you know, raise money, to write white papers, to have convenings. And what we've really realized as we're scaling is that we do a lot of talking about people, but not as much talking uh, with people. And so that's something that we're really committed to, um, to working on. So we're um, launching um, new elements of our, our website, which are really going to allow people to uh, play with and look at some of this data um, themselves and also make sure that we're writing and talking in ways that are um, ways that people would talk about themselves and making sure that we're committed to, to really creating that loop primarily using data to benefit the people the data belongs to. Um, I can share uh, resistance labs and contest every race. Uh, we, have a, we have a relatively limited set of folks that we're trying to communicate with, um, kind of the internal players in the political environment primarily. And so, uh, you know, we're pulling together donor briefings. Um, we are, you know, kind of working through uh, networks to try and try and basically set up meetings with uh, the folks that, that we think need to hear about this data. That's our primary primary way. We may decide we need to kind of go public and publish this, um, but uh, we think there's a benefit to doing this under the radar, so we haven't done that yet. Vanessa, you're muted, I believe. I'm in the middle, sorry, I was having some tech issues a minute ago. Oh. Um, I'm actually writing, I do a bunch of the things that you folks do. Um, I'm writing a paper right now about what we are actually doing. Like the, what is the methodology that we get where we get this digital thing and then people become different by it. Um, 
that is connecting it to research. So I think that's, that's feeling like an important communication to us. I don't know what yet what I'm going to do with it or where it's going to go. I actually also wanted to respond to the previous question because we embed our measurement in our program directly that when we call it missions and so forth, that was the idea is that the measurement is in the software. It's, it's motivated by the program. And so the surveying essentially is what happens. We call it a mission report. Um, so it's, it's deeply integrated into what we do. So the person who's handling it is, I'm writing the questions um, with consultation, but the data is actually being collected, and then we have other team members who actually work with the data. I'm curious how folks um, have, ooh, okay, no, I'm taking, I'm gonna take the submitted question. Um, this is actually similar to what I was going to ask. So I was going to ask uh, how folks have landed on their sort of most compelling data or anecdote um, that they use to kind of convince people to see the world in their way. Um, the question that Wes got was about um, reevaluating uh, metrics, which I think is sort of a related question around iterating on how you collect metrics and story tell around them. So feel free to answer either or both parts of that question, how you land on your metrics or how you change them when they need to be updated. We're in the middle of reevaluating our metrics. I kind of referred to that when I spoke earlier because we were so focused on the behavior changes data that we had, but really other people, there are other ways and other people who do that as well or better than us. Whereas our USP is more around changing kids and changing their worldviews. So we're trying to learn how to, it's actually an open question right now. How can we actually measure that kind of immeasurable thing, especially with the privacy around children that is inherent in our space. We can't go and find children a year later or two years later and ask them how they've changed. We have had anecdotes that we receive sometimes. I have one 28-year-old uh, woman who told me she saw a show of ours when she was six, went on to found um, three nonprofits, including one in high school that, was, that went across the city in terms of banning bottled water. And um, so those kind, of, that, those kind of changes, again, they're hard to measure, um, just like um, at Harkin and, uh, and, well, with everybody. But that's, that's this thing that is up for us now. Um, so we're always kind of looking at uh, what is the big questions like what does it actually mean to save money is saving a, um, an action is saving a dollar amount um, and how do we really move the needle on that so it's definitely an ongoing uh, question that we have uh, so we are looking at things like savings of rates so you know we can see in our technology what someone was doing before they joined in their um, savings account versus what they were doing after and so we're looking at that um, but then, of course, you always have this question of like, well, so what, you know, um, it, how would someone's life change because they maybe now have $500 in the bank when they didn't have that money before. So we're also implementing some more longer term um, metrics, really looking at um, people's kind of changing situation in terms of financial stability. And some of that we take from other organizations who have uh, established national kind of level scores or panels on some of these um, issues. But it's definitely something that we look at and learn um, from all the time. And I think can be challenging if you're a tech-driven um, nonprofit that's funded with philanthropy, um, because uh, you know any of you who are funded with philanthropy know that you have to you know, fill out that proposal of what you're gonna do and two years later report on what it was that you did. And you know, in the, in the tech world, you're always trying to change things and, and innovate. And at the end of two years, like, oh yeah, did we, you know, how did we achieve these things? Or did we really? So those are some of the, the challenges that we've been, we've been facing. I will share briefly um, about Contest of Your Race. Um, you know, the first number we got actually was a, a, just a simple question we asked people who had taken any action. Uh, we asked, uh, you know, people who had made a phone call to try to, you know, stop Trump in a rural area if they would consider running for office. And we got 10% of them texting us back saying they might, be, might potentially be interested. And so that was, that was kind of our first aha moment there's something here and we could have maybe we could have stopped with that and, and focused kind of just like oh let's just get as many people kind of raising their hand to say they might be interested in running for office as possible let's measure that um but i think i'm i'm proud of the culture that we've set up where we're actually really focused on like 
causal, causally inferred impact on the world. Um, and so, you know, every state we go into where we're, we just recruited for 700 uh, uncontested positions in Virginia, we're working on 1400 uncontested races in Georgia next month, um, we will do a control trial. And so um, actually feel confident about kind of our impact and measurement. And I feel like we have a, a clear understanding of our impact in the world because we're doing that. Um, amazing. Thank you. Um, if any of our speakers have like a parting 20 second thought, um, I'm going to leave a little bit of time to turn it over to Wes actually to talk about how New Media Ventures thinks about um, measuring impacts, which is basically how they think about you all. Um, but I want to give our speakers one more chance to share uh, any final insights if any of you want to chime in. This is Jen. Um, I would just say what we try to think about, and I think we could get more intentional and kind of structured around, is what are the different stakeholders that we need to be aligned with this work and to support us in some way, whether that's partnering with us or, or funding us in some way, and what is it that they're caring most about, and what are the metrics that are kind of the metrics du jour or the, the topics du jour uh, that they are, they are looking at, and just tailoring, making sure we don't have the same set of data for everyone because it just becomes really noisy noisy if we're not actually hitting the thing that it seems like they care about. And then sometimes just straight up asking them, like, what's most important to you right now? Like, how do you view success? And then getting back to them later with our version of that. Um, so not feeling pressure to, like, throw the kitchen sink at them, because I think it can get overwhelming with so many different data points and anecdotes. I will add, um, if anyone's interested in, in reading any of our researchers on our website, own.org. Um, but, you know, we are primarily a direct service organization and um, looking to kind of use uh, what we have and what we do in terms of data and digital advocacy um, to promote economic security for, you know, um, underserved, underrepresented Americans. So we would actually be really interested in talking to anyone who may want to partner with us or anyone who may have questions that they, we have a user group that we're setting up um, uh, to survey and interview on issues. Uh, we have a lot of data that runs through our platform, as I've mentioned. So if there are folks listening who um, uh, are working on uh, issues related to economic security, economic mobility, um, and would benefit from um, help, you know, helping us think through our data or accessing that data, um, we would love to hear from you. We have uh, clients in all 50 states. Sweet. Um, I heard, uh, in addition to a lot of good insights, also some mentions here and there of some sort of templates and artifacts that people have, um, firms that they partner with, uh, spreadsheets they use to collect insights internally, et cetera. So um, if uh, folks have things like that, they can share either speakers or other people on the call. Particularly, I think what's been useful for folks in the portfolio is gaining access to other people's templates um, so that we don't all have to create from scratch. Um, I will follow up when I follow up after this to try to gather some of those resources um, for the portfolio more broadly. So um, I'm gonna kick it over to Wes um, to uh, sort of return the favor in a sense and talk a little bit about how New Media Ventures thinks about um, impact measurement and uh, how that relates to you all. Thanks, Laura, and thanks everyone. I'm aspiring to be efficient and quick uh, and want to start first just by saying thank you to the speakers, to the folks on the phone, our whole portfolio for really being so intentional and thoughtful about impact measurement. So much, but one area I really feel solidarity with you all and the work that you're doing is the fact that uh, from a new media ventures perspective, I think we've thought a lot about all of these issues in terms of how to measure impact, when and if to reevaluate the metrics that we're using, uh, and the fact that we often are perpetually are raising money that we are then able to invest or grant out to folks like you, and in those conversations are getting asked a lot of the same questions that I imagine you all are in many different contexts about uh, how performance and, and the impact that we're driving. Um, so thank you for all that. And in light of that, I really wanted to give everyone from a new media ventures perspective some quick insight into historically how we've thought about measuring our impact and then 
now and moving forward, how we're thinking about tweaking and continuing to refine that process. So a lot of this may resonate with you and how you've interacted with us or we've <laughs> asked to interact with you before. But two categories I think I wanted to flag about how we've thought about this historically. The first is around the, certain, the types of metrics that we've gathered and it's been shifting at various moments in our history and then the way that we've collected those metrics. So the two categories of metrics I think we've thought a lot about is the value of our intervention or uh, interaction with the startups and organizations in our portfolio. So we, we really track things like the amount of money that we individually move to startups, as well as the amount of money from our broader network of angel investors, funders, philanthropic funders, uh, and the money that we've catalyzed from that network. Uh, and we've asked, and then we've also thought a lot about across the portfolio, how health and growth is going for those organizations. So metrics like which organizations are still operating, what revenue growth looks like, or staff growth, those types of things. We've collected those metrics through various channels, a year-end impact assessment that we've done and probably pinged many of you about before. Uh, we've asked for consistent updates uh, on a quarterly basis about how your work is going so that we can flag that and share those great anecdotes and conversations we have with our networks in the world, and then ad hoc requests for certain documentation about impact that we make. I think for us, one of the both challenge and opportunity from an impact perspective is that kind of along the lines of what Vanessa said, like our mission is to shift power and is kind of this, and we do that in, through investments in many different categories. And that there's so many ways we can think about that and talk about that. So in the last couple of uh, months, Laura has been leading uh, with some light support for me, some research on how we can refine the impact measurement process. And what we're hoping to do moving forward is really to still our, get a little more concrete and specific in our asks to the portfolio and distill it to a couple of metrics that we want to have regular updates on. Uh, there will be some metric around the scale of your impact, uh, kind of a qualitative metric about latest and greatest anecdotes, and then a metric around uh, kind of organizational health. Uh, and we really want that to be straightforward. And what we're planning to do is when we launch our new portfolio coming out of our current open call or our new cohort coming out of our current open call, we're going to be sending out more information about that process. Uh, that timeline will be mid-August to both the new cohort and the existing cohort and piloting that refined or tweaked approach with a subset of our portfolio, both new, a mix of new and old organizations to try to see if that process can be more fluid uh, and if we can make it easier on you so that it doesn't take time away from the work and the flow of the, more import the most important things that you have on your plate. So hopefully that's at least like a, a helpful teaser in terms of how we thought about it, where we're going, uh, and happy to answer questions outside of this call if anyone has specific uh, interests, but stay tuned for more as we move forward. Thank you, Les. Um, thank you, everybody, for um, your questions. A special thank you to our speakers. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to try to collect templates and links to who folks are working with both from speakers and anyone else who has someone uh, or something good they want to share if you have other questions feel free to submit them via the listserv or send them to me i will send out a follow-up survey to figure out um, how useful and impactful this webinar was so please 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 fill that out and uh the recording of this will be posted in your resources folder in the next couple weeks thank you so much everybody Take care. Thanks for having us.